Okay, good evening to all of you. <clears throat> so welcome to our class. Okay. And maybe to have a quick uh, recap of what we were discussing uh, the last week. We were discussing on cost of capital, okay, as one of the uh, topic within the big topic on uh, the financing decision. Okay, <clears throat> and we did say that the cost of capital, essentially, uh, this is a return that the different providers of capital uh, shall be expecting to receive for their investment for their capital investment uh, they have made in the company. Okay, so you as the finance manager, you may want to uh, make an assessment, okay, as to whether uh, which finance, as you may want to make a decision as to how much cost the company shall be incurring uh, for the use of maybe equity financing, okay, for the use of uh, debt financing, for the use of preference uh, uh, shares as a finance option, okay. So simply trying to quantify uh, the different return uh, that you will be, okay, so the different costs that different providers of capital uh, shall be uh, incurring, okay. So you may need to uh, make that assessment. Uh, if possible, okay, so let's not use the video, okay, for the sake uh, of conserving the data, okay. So essentially, <clears throat> when you are discussing on how we get the cost of equity, okay, when you get, uh, we were discussing on how to use the cost of equity, uh, we discussed that we can use two models, okay, there are two models that you can use when it comes to assessing the cost of equity, okay, we have uh, the use of the deemed uh, valuation model, Okay, we have the use of the capital asset pricing model. Okay, <clears throat> and just to have my board. Okay, okay. Uh, so we did make a mention. Okay, on the two models that I use when it comes to estimating the cost of equity. Okay, cost of equity. And we say that we can use the dividend valuation model. <clears throat> model. And you can also use a capital asset pricing model. You can also use a capital asset pricing model. Okay, so these are the two models uh, that we didn't mention that you can use, simply called the CAPEM. Okay, so in the dividend valuation model, we say that you can go ahead and uh, class what they mean to, depending on whether uh, there's growth in dividend or there's no growth in dividend. Okay, so in case you assume that there's no growth in dividend, okay, so in case you assume there's no growth, okay, in dividend. We see that the cost of equity in this context will be equal to R A is equal to the dividend, okay, divide by P naught, and we express that as a percent. If there's growth in dividend, okay, so here there's growth in dividend, the cost of equity R A is equal to uh, D naught one plus G, P naught plus G, okay, that's what we discussed under the case of growth in dividend, okay, the derivation model, okay. In the capital asset pricing model, in the capital asset Maybe just here to go ahead and have maybe a slight div uh, okay a slight diversion. We also did discuss on how we do estimate the growth. Okay, we also did discuss how we get the growth. Okay, so the G, how we estimate the G, and we said we can estimate the growth in dividend using two models. Okay, or rather you can use two methods. Okay, uh, the first one was the so-called the extrapolation method. Okay, so simply try uh, to extrapolate the the past. Uh, growth in dividend uh, into uh, if the growth in dividend in the last four years was three percent, then you can assume that going forward uh, that the same growth shall be replicated. So going forward would also be equal to three percent uh, what has been experienced in the past three years, for example. Okay. We said you can also use the Gordon's approximation method. Mm -hmm. The Gordon's uh, approximation method, okay, or simply the so-called uh, the retention model, okay, or so called the retention model. Well, you say the cost of the growth in dividend, okay, it will be equal to uh, the return on equity, it's ROE, the return on equity, uh, we multiply by the retention ratio, okay, the return on equity, we multiply by the retention ratio, okay, they start, we say that can you estimate the growth in dividend. <clears throat> and the capital surprise model, okay, we say that the cost of equity, okay, uh, the RE, 
the cost of equity is equal to uh, the risk-free return. Uh, we multiply by equity beta for that particular stock. And we multiply by the, um, uh, the uh, what we call the market excess return, okay? The RM minus the risk-free rate of return, okay? So all these things here, yeah, what we discussed at last time, okay? And maybe just to check, hoping that I'm not talking to myself. Let me check, is Luke here? Just confirm whether my audios are okay. Uh, yes. It's all clear? Yeah. Ah, okay, thank you, Luke. <clears throat> Then we went ahead and also did discuss on how we get the cost of uh, equity and how the cost of debt. Okay. We went ahead and also did discuss on how we do get the cost of debt. Okay, the cost of debt. We see the cost of debt. We have to first consider uh, what instrument we are dealing with. Okay, what are the features of that particular instrument? Okay, uh, what type of debt are we dealing with? Okay. If, for example, we are discussing case of bonds, okay, we may want to know what type of bonds are you, are you dealing with, okay? Uh, if, for example, we have, uh, let's say, bonds that are maybe deemed to be uh, irredeemable, okay? If the bonds are irredeemable, irredeemable bonds, that is, essentially, uh, the company has no obligation to pay back the capital, okay? The company has no obligation uh, to pay back the capital. Now, how do the cost of the bond? How do the cost of this bond, okay? Uh, we say that if it follow the fundamental theory of valuation, okay, the market value of that bond, P0, will be equal to the interest that you get paid as a holder, uh, we divide by the cost of the bond, okay? And we simply just make RD, the sum of formula, which will be equal to the interest you receive, uh, we divide by the current X interest market value of that bond, okay? And that's how we do estimate the cost of the bond, assuming that this bond is irredeemable. If the bond is redeemable, if the bond is redeemable, if the bond is redeemable, okay, we say that uh, it's old enough that we gained all of the model shall be using, okay, the method shall be using uh, is based on the trial and error method, okay, is a trial and error method, okay, is a trial and error method, okay. Uh, and here, we don't forget to go back to our IRR formula, okay, so you're going to be estimating the cost uh, of the equity uh, by, use, by the use of trial and error method, okay, using uh, the IRR formula, okay, I'm um, presupposing that, don't forget, uh, that you still remember how to use to apply that formula, okay, so here we're going to be applying uh, that formula uh, when it comes to estimating uh, the cost of equity, the, the cost of debt, assume this debt or this bond is redeemable. If the bond is convertible, okay, which I think it's what, I'm not sure that we discussed how we get the cost of bond if it is convertible. I'm not sure whether we did discuss that. Just to confirm <clears throat> from uh, Luke. Luke, did we discuss Mosotti, Did we discuss uh, how we get the cost of the bond, assuming that it is uh, convertible? Uh, no, we have not done. We did. Uh, we have not done that. Yeah, we did. Oh. The we did in the case for bond that is uh, redeemable. Also. Yeah. Okay. So we did apply the IRR formula. Yes. Yeah, okay, fair enough, okay. And then today, I think then we can start off from there, how we get the cost of the bond, assuming that this bond is convertible. Okay, how do you get the cost of the bond, assuming that the bond is convertible? <clears throat> now, in case you assume that, that the bond is convertible, okay, in case that you assume the conversion, don't forget, I think we did discuss on uh, bonds that are convertible. When we were discussing on the finance sources, uh, we discussed how we do the valuation of bonds that are convertible. Okay, We did discuss how do we value uh, bonds that are convertible and bonds that are, uh, that, that are redeemable, as well as bonds that are redeemable. And if you remember, okay, so this is simply a call. Okay, uh, So we call... <clears throat> But we say that's the market value, okay, that the market value of a financial instrument, okay, is simply uh, the sum total of the present value of all the cash flows that as a holder you shall be receiving, okay. Therefore, simply the P, therefore, the P not the market value of the bond shall be equal to, okay, the sum uh, of interest you receive, okay, from the first year all the way to the end of the year. So the sum of in present value of the interest you'll be receiving, okay, so one plus R to the power of uh, cost of debt, 
okay, uh, plus the present value of redemption value, okay, one plus R, we discount back to year zero, okay. That's the simply get the market value, assuming that this is simply a straight bond, okay, it's a conventional bond. However, now this time round, don't forget this bond is uh, the convertible bond, okay, don't forget here, our title more is uh, the convertible bonds. <clears throat> this bond can be converted. In this case, therefore, don't forget in uh, the holder, of in the final year, they don't, they can not just redeem the bond, okay? But they can also carry the conversion, okay? So they have the option of either redeeming the bond in the final year or converting that bond. So therefore, in the final year, we have two values, okay? We have the redemption value and you have the conversion value, okay? So assuming that this holder uh, is a wealth maximizer, okay? So if you assume that this is going to have, I would call the, the investor, okay? The rational, okay? Uh, assuming the investor rationality, okay? rationality <clears throat> then either the holder in the end year okay so in the end year they are going to be compare to compare the conversion value versus the redemption value okay whichever is greater okay whichever uh, is greater whichever is greater okay so they're going to compare the two options should i redeem or should i convert the bond okay which is going to grant me more, more wealth okay and as you mentioned, don't forget the redemption value, okay? Where do we get the redemption value, okay? Where do we get the redemption value? <clears throat> okay, the redemption value, okay? Our R over here, the redemption value, our R over here, okay? Don't forget you're going to simply uh, be referring to, okay? So refer uh, to the board covenant, okay? So simply here, you're going to be referring to the board covenant, okay? That is the agreement, okay, between the holder and the issuer, okay? So redemption value is going to be said. In your exam, maybe it is not going to be stated, and we say that what do you do? We assume that the redemption value is a power value, okay? So if it's not given, then of course we said, assume the redemption value to be equal to the power value of the bond, okay? Most likely will be given, but if not, then simply assume the redemption value is equal to the power value. Now the next question is that, now how do we determine, okay? So we've done the redemption value. The next now is how do we determine uh, the conversion value? Now conversion value, on the other hand, <coughs> conversion value, okay? Now we say that conversion value is simply equal to the market value of the equity share, okay? And is the market value of equity share to be received per bond, okay? Equity share, uh, equity shares received, okay? In exchange of the bond, okay? In exchange of the bond. So here, don't forget the holder, okay, that is the board holder, okay, will be receiving equity shares and give up the bond, okay. Now, simply, what's the market value of those equity shares he'll be receiving, okay, that's referred to as uh, the conversion value, okay. So this simply is a recap, because I think uh, we have already discussed this together, okay. And the next question is that, now, how do we get the conversion value, okay, how do we get the market value of those equity shares, okay. We say that conversion value, okay, is equal to conversion ratio we multiply by the share price in the time at the time of conversion, okay. That's how we get the conversion value, okay. It's simply the conversion ratio uh, we multiply by the share price at the time of conversion, okay. That's how simply uh, we do estimate uh, what should be uh, the market value of those, uh, the market value of the share to be received in exchange of the bond. Next question is how do we get there for? Okay, <clears throat> how do we get the conversion ratio? Okay, how do we get uh, the conversion ratio? And how therefore do we also get uh, the share price? Okay, how do we get the conversion value? And how do we get the share price? Okay. So this is the question that we need to ask ourselves. Okay, how do we get conversion value? And how do we get the conversion uh, ratio? Okay. Now conversion ratio, okay, so the conversion ratio, we simply going to be, you refer uh, to the covenant, okay, refer to the covenant, the agreement, okay. Suppose by the time that this bond was issued, uh, the shareholder, the, the company, okay, uh, that is issuing the bond M, okay, the company issuing the bond uh, M, the uh, uh, investors in those bonds, okay, have an agreement, okay, that X year from now, uh, you shall convert one bond for X number of shares, okay, so, this is going to be contained uh, in the contract, in the covenant, okay? So simply refer to the covenant, okay? Now the next is that how do you tell me therefore the share price, okay? The share, the share, uh, PN is share price at the time of conversion, okay? Share price, conversion time, okay? Don't forget that, conversion time, okay? <clears throat> conversion time, okay? 
That is the PM, okay? Is the share price at the time of conversion, okay? Okay, so share price, okay? Uh, at conversion time, okay? So, uh, if conversion is going to occur maybe five years from now, okay, if the conversion is going to occur uh, 10 years from now, okay, now how are you going to be estimating what to be the share price then, okay? So you say that the share price, okay, PN, okay, is going to be given us, we estimate from the current share price, okay, it is going to go to the current share price, P0, okay, uh, one plus G, okay, uh, to the power of N, okay, where we are simply saying that PN, okay, is share price, Okay, share price conversion time. Okay, and you're assuming conversion occur uh, at time n. Okay, so n here is conversion. Okay, time. Okay, or number of years conversion. Okay, uh, p naught we are simply is in the current share price. Okay, so p naught is the current share price. Okay, so we have to discuss all this in together. And we suppose that you should remember them, okay? And G, don't forget here, G, you have to be quite careful, okay? And the G is not the growth in the dividend, like the one we discussed uh, in the dividend evaluation model. The G here is the growth in the share price, okay? So G is annual share price growth, annual share price growth, okay? Annual share price growth, okay? So all these are uh, estimated for us, therefore, what will be the share price at the time of conversion, okay? And just uh, to refer to uh, the previous slide, <clears throat> we are saying that conversion value, therefore, okay, is conversion ratio times the PN, the one we just calculated, on, okay, times the PN, okay, so which we have just done here, okay. Therefore, simply, okay, going back to our notes before, okay, so therefore, in the final year, okay, that is in the end year, and then the holder, you compare the two, should I convert or should I redeem the bond, okay. Now, our main concern, okay, was how do you therefore get the cost of the debt, okay? How do you therefore the cost, uh, how do you get the RD, okay, from a formula here, the cost of the debt, okay? We simply go back, we use the trial and error method, okay? The same, same way, the same process uh, that we did discuss under, okay, uh, the cost of uh, our bonds that are redeemable, okay? The same process we'll be using, okay, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to estimating uh, what should be uh, the cost of the convertible bond. Okay, the same same process that we shall be following. Okay, <clears throat> so here simply, okay, to estimate the cost of debt, to estimate the cost of the convertible debt. Okay, to estimate the cost of uh, convertible, okay, convertible bonds. <clears throat> okay, use trial and error method. Okay, the trial and error method. Maybe. Uh, just like the, just like the case of, like the case of redeeming bonds. Okay, the same same way, the same the process that we followed uh, shall be the same process that shall be following in this example also. So the same process uh, that we shall be following when it comes to estimating the cost uh, of the convertible bond. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, in case you have a question, uh, you let me know. Okay, so maybe you can just try an example. Okay, we can try an example uh, to check as to whether we can be able to apply those concepts. Okay, okay, so because we need to estimate the cost of the convertible bond. Okay, uh, so go through it in the next maybe two minutes. Okay, okay, one minute then we discuss it together. Okay. So attempt the question. First go through the question, then I will uh, not actually estimate the question, estimate the cost of debt first, because it's simply the same same way, okay, uh, that we did discuss, okay, how you, I hope you, all of you are there last week, okay, how we get the cost of the convertible, the cost of the bonds that are redeemable, Okay, so it's the same, same process, okay? The only difference I've said is how, therefore, do you estimate the conversion value? That's the only difference. You're applying the IRR formula, okay? So maybe you can take four minutes. So take four minutes, do it on your own, on, on your side, okay? Then you shall compare uh, what you shall do, to, do, do together with what you have, okay? That's how learning occurs, okay? In case you try, okay? You learn a concept, then you try to apply it, okay? Uh, so attempt in the next four minutes. Okay, attempt the next format this particular question. Okay, attempt, attempt to get the cost of this convertible bond. 
Okay, I presuppose that you have done something from your side, okay? And you don't confirm your answer, okay? Do that you to start with, maybe you may want to write your answer on the chat, uh, then we shall compare. I'm assuming that you've done something, okay? So this example, okay, we do have a bond. Oh, would you want more minute? Let me just ask someone whether they have done something. Ebontane. Yes, Ebontane. Yes. You, you've done, or you want more, you want a minute? I'm still trying to understand the question. Oh. Okay, so you want more, you want more time? I think we should do it together so that I understand it well. Okay, that's a bon tani. We need. We need. Yes. Yes, are yes. You have you attempted the question? Or you're stuck? Not yet. Yeah. You're stuck? I'm you're trying, stuck? though. You, you're trying. OK, two minutes. Those were still trying. OK, suppose that at least you have tried something. Okay, let's attempt the question together. <clears throat> a company has issued a convertible note which are due to be redeemed at 5% premium in five years time. Okay, uh, in this context, okay, uh, don't forget it to be 5% premium to the power value, okay, because I don't think there's a mention uh, regarding uh, the redemption value. Okay, so simply to redeem at 5% premium to the redemption value. Okay, so that's uh, what you need to get note of. Okay, so let me share my board. Mm. Okay, so redemption value, okay, will be 5% premium. So it will be one of 5% multiplied by the power value. So you, if you go to the question again, okay, let me uh, go back to my question. <clears throat> There's no way to about the power value of the, the power value of the bond. Okay. However, if you can you can't derive, okay, but it is possible for us to be able, you can see here that the market value, okay, it's eighty-five dollars. Okay, the market value is eighty-five dollars. So generally the, the the closest power value of this bond can be is a hundred. Okay. So conventionally, actually you have two we have two two power values. Okay, so either you have one thousand, okay, or you have one hundred, okay. Uh, so for this example, there's no way the power value can be a thousand. Okay, so this is not a question because the market value is at five. But if, for example, the market value was eight fifty, then the power value of a thousand makes sense. But here, you can see uh, the market value is more or less way below. It's eight five. So the closest can be uh, is is hundred. Okay, that's how you estimate the power value of the bond. So most likely, it is a thousand or hundred. Okay, so in this context, it can, it, it can only uh, be a hundred. Okay, therefore, going back to my board here, <clears throat> so you want to 5% times the power value of 100 to give a therefore one of five dollars. We compare that with the conversion value, okay, with the conversion value, conversion ratio, we multiply by the share price at the time of conversion, okay. So let's go back to the question. We estimate how many equity shares you get per bond, okay. So the number of equity share you get per bond. <clears throat> You told that you're going to get 20 owner shares. Okay, you can see here there'll be 20 equity shares that will be getting. That's going to have a conversion value, okay, conversion ratio. Okay, and the conversion occurs, they can be converted on the same date, okay, the same date of redemption, which is the case case is five years from now. Okay, so uh, the, we need to estimate the share price uh, five years from now. Okay, five years from now. Okay, so conversion occurs in five years from now. From now okay. Currently, we will be told that one share is going for $4, okay? So if currently one share is for four, and the growth is equal to 7% per year, okay? The growth is 7% per year. 
the note is giving the share price five years from now, assuming a seven percent growth per annum. Okay, let's go back to the board. Okay. With the commercial, commercial ratio that we share we get is 20. Okay. Then the current share price will be told is equal to four. Okay. And we told that the growth in the share price is equal to seven percent. Okay. Let me just confirm that that was the case. If we told is equal to seven percent. Yes, it is the case. Okay. It is equal to seven percent. So 1.07 to the power of five years. Conversion occurs in five years' time. Okay. And that gives you therefore what will be the conversion value. Give us how much? Okay, your answer here from Esther, which gave us 112.2. Confirm? Yes, Stacy has confirmed, as well as Michelle, 112.2 dollars be uh, there for the conversion value. Okay, so simply compare the two of them, uh, where they gain convert or redeem. And by default, it makes sense since you are well maximizer to convert the bond. Because conversion is 112, uh, redemption is 105. So convert the bond. Okay. Mm -hmm. Convert. Why? Because the redemption value, okay, convert the bond. Since the redemption value is less than conversion value, or simply conversion value is greater than the redemption value. Okay. <clears throat> Therefore, the market value of this bond will be equal to. So we need actually before we get the, the market value, okay, we may need also uh, to estimate what should be uh, the interest you'll be getting per year for the next five years. Okay, the interest you get per year for the next seven years, so five years. So the next thing is we estimate the interest. The interest you get as a holder, okay, don't forget to say that you have to be quite careful, is your tax, okay, do you pay tax? Okay, let me go back to the question, you see whether you do pay tax, and this is, yes, there's tax here, okay, so here we have tax. So we have tax here of 30%, okay, so therefore the interest income you get is going to be 30% less, okay, so you don't get the entire of it, okay, but you only get 30%. You only get 30%, because 30% uh, will go more or less to uh, cater for tax. Therefore, the interest you're receiving, don't forget the coupon here, you are receiving is 8%, okay? The coupon is 8%. However, you don't get the entire percent. You get 7% of the 8% because of tax, okay? So let's go back to our board. Mm -hmm. The interest you get will be 8% times the power value, which is the power value link I've just mentioned is 100, okay? However, you don't get the entire of it, that percent is in tax. Therefore, you only get the 70%. And this therefore give us uh, 5.6, okay? Therefore, for the next five years, uh, every year you get 5.6 of a dollar, okay? For the next five years, that's what we get in. Then in the final year, you get the conversion value, the 112.2, okay? Therefore, the market value of this bond, okay, P0, is equal to, we are saying it's given as uh, the interest you're receiving, okay, times present value and it factor, okay, five years R percent, okay, plus the conversion value in present value terms, okay, so five years R percent, okay, that's how we get the market value. And the market value of this bond, the P0, okay, the market value of this bond, okay, you have already been given to us, okay, so if you have to go to uh, our notes, we told that the market value of this bond, okay, is equal to 85. So here we have the market value of the bond, 85, okay. So now we can go to equate our equation. Therefore, 85 will be equal to the interest you receive, in the interest is 5.6, so it's equal to 5.6 times present value and in factor, five years R percent, plus conversion value, we have it here, 12.2 times present value interest factor, uh, five years R percent, okay? So you have what variables require. So all we don't have here is R, okay? What we don't have is the R here, okay? And this is what we want to estimate, okay? What should be our R, okay? That is going to uh, make our equation. Okay, so here as we apply the trial and error method. Okay, let me go to my next board. <clears throat> Hope it's all clear. Don't forget to answer your question. Uh, you can use a chat or you can raise your hand up. Okay, therefore, if you take 
sorry, <clears throat> let's say therefore, if we take the 85, let me just go back, if we take 85 to the other side, okay, so they've come as zero, okay, we have seen that the equation balances, okay, and of course, if it is balancing, the difference is equal to zero, therefore, okay, therefore, zero be equal to <clears throat> negative 85, okay, uh, plus, okay, uh, present value added factor, uh, five years, R percent, okay, mm, sorry, Applied by the interest we're getting, and the interest we get is 5.6 per year for the next five years, plus the present value of the redemption value, conversion value, okay, sorry, present value interest factor, uh, five years R percent, okay. Trial and error, okay, with the trial and error method, okay. So generally, okay, use a table, whatever you prefer to use, okay. But generally, let me use a table here, just real straight. <clears throat> so you can have the period, okay, so you can have period. Okay, period zero, one to five, and here I can have five. Okay, so I want to have a simple table. Okay, so we can have a table here. Okay, sort of. Okay, so in this table, so you can have period, okay, that's my first column, then here I can have um, cash flow, okay, and cash flow has the four years zero, okay, P not here, okay, is negative eight five, okay, from here to your five, I have it here, which is 5.6, 5.6. Then year five, it is year five, I'm converting and I get 112.2. Then I can, I can have the factor, present value, uh, discount factors. Okay, so here you can just call it discount factor or just discount factor actually. Let me just use here. There it is. This is discount factor. Then here I can have present value. This is present value. Okay, this is cause is one because it's year one, the factor. Then here you can read for the table. Okay, I don't know how much it is. Okay, simply for the table, <clears throat> and there should be zero point something. Okay, then here you get the sum total. Okay, so here we are going to get the sum total. Okay, of the present value. Then you can have our, our second discount rate. And here, don't forget, by the way, what discount rate do you use here? Okay, generally, if you remember, I told you that the cost of this bond, okay, the cost of this bond. Uh, should not be too far apart from the cost of the same bond, okay, if it was to be redeemable, okay. This bond is convertible, okay, but its cost will not be too far from the cost of the same bond if it was to be irredeemable, if it was to be irredeemable, okay. Now, what would be the cost of this bond if it was to be redeemable? Okay? You don't need to do this, okay. This is just to assist you uh, in being able to not just have an idea, okay, where the cost of this bond should be, okay. So let me just have some, you don't need to do this, okay, but generally this can assist you, okay. The cost of the same bond, if it was irredeemable, okay, would be equal to the interest, which is 5.6, we divide by the market value of this bond, okay, which is 85, okay. We express this as a percent, okay. Now, this is the cost of the same bond, if it was irredeemable, okay. So, the cost of this bond will be too far apart from the cost of the, this, uh, of the same bond, if it was irredeemable, okay. And what do you get? You want to reduce your number of trials, okay? So simply uh, by uh, getting to know, okay, what would be the cost of the same bond if it will be if it was to be redeemable, okay? You get how much? Okay, an answer. <clears throat> and you have six point nine, okay, six point five nine, okay, six point five from Mister, okay, six point five nine, okay. So roughly, let's begin at seven percent, okay? So we come, we discount this cash flows, okay? We have the discount rate we're going to use here. Will be seven percent, okay. So that's because of our first trial, okay. We use a use seven percent, okay. So in case you discount the same cash flows, okay. Now these eight five, okay, uh, five point six and one twelve are ten percent, okay, from the tables, okay. Don't forget the five point six is an annuity, okay, because it's year one to year five, okay. But this is a single cash flow, okay. What do you get to be the sum? <clears throat> so the factor you just did from the table, okay. Okay, what's the factor for seven percent? Five years as an annuity. 
I'm presupposing you all have the tables. Okay, from the question bank, you should be able to get what's the factor for five years, 20% as an annuity. Okay, from the table, we have it here, it's 4.1002. Okay, and five years, uh, 7% as a single cash flow, discounted is a single cash flow, zero point. Okay, we have it here, which is equal to 0 0.713, okay? So simply therefore, the present value will be equal to the factor, okay? We have here, we multiply by the cash flow. So here we get negative 85. Here we get how much? Column uh, for the second, for the entity, present value. Okay, present value. Uh, we get to be equal to 22.996. For the and you take, uh, for this uh, conversion value, what's the present value of the conversion value? The present value conversion value. So roughly we get 80, okay? So we get 80. Uh, don't forget, in case we have to discount these cash flows using the appropriate discount rate, if the cost of, the, of this bond was 7%, okay, therefore, we should get a sum of the, two, of the three cash flows, the sum of these three cash flows. Okay, the sum of these three cash flows ought to give us uh, the sum of 85, sorry, the sum of 85, 22.96, and 80, okay, uh, should give us a zero. But don't forget that the year zero is a negative year, okay? Don't know what you get? You get 17.96. We get 17.96 positive, like this happens. Okay, we get 17.96, okay? Now, what does that mean? They imply, therefore, that generally, this is not the cost of this bond, okay? Therefore, we need to uh, use a second discount rate, okay? Uh, now, here, you can choose any other, whatever you, you prefer, okay? It's a trial and error method, okay? Now, what if I was to discount the same, same cash flow, okay, by, for example, uh, let's say 10%, okay? Ensure uh, sure the two rates are not too far apart, okay? So let me just choose 10% to be my second discount rate, okay? My second discount factor, okay, my discount, discount factor will be at 10%, okay? So I repeat the same, same process, okay? I repeat the same, same process, okay? I have a column here, I have a column here. I can extend this, okay? I want to extend these lines. Don't worry about my table, okay? So now the discount factor here is going to be as per, okay? Uh, will be as per the 10%, okay? Year zero is equal to one, okay? 10%, uh, okay, the factor is going to be, I don't know, uh, how much it will be equal to, okay? Uh, the same applies for five years, okay? So it's the process, okay? Now here, we get the present value, okay? The present value, which is going to be the cash flow times the factor, okay? Cash flow, times the factor you're going to obtain uh, for each of the year, for each of those years. What do you get the sum here? For 7%, we got 17.96, and for 10%, what do you get? Okay, Okay, we have seemed to have an answer, some answers here. Okay, uh, we get hmm, five, okay, 5.89, okay, from most of you, okay. I won't turn it, okay, you may want to check, maybe, I'm, I'm presupposing the others seem to be right. I'm not sure, okay, check us whether how you got 6.22, 5, point, okay, 6. Well, okay, someone else to confirm that, uh, those answers. Don't round off in your workings. So try as much as possible to avoid uh, uh, rounding off too early. 5.89, okay. So Stacy, I think you may have done a rounding off as well as maybe uh, check, a botany check also. So we seem to have someone have a question. Let's go over. His hand is up. <clears throat> Let me unmute you. You've run away. The sound was hard was up. Oh, they've ran away. Okay, so I presume that all oh, you all have 5.89. So, Ebontani, just to confirm, as okay, I want to get Stacey was running off error. 
Ebontane, just to confirm us how you got 6.22. Let me just unmute you. Just to confirm that. Are you Ebontane? Yes, Ebontane. Um, I'm trying to confirm if my figure is... Oh, you're trying to confirm your figures. If my figure is 3.7908 okay. or 06. So you see, it's how much? Because my annual figure, I, I have 3708. I don't know if it's 08 or 06. I'm oh. sure that is where the problem is. Oh, okay, okay. Check, check. Okay, so if we suppose that we all have 5.896, okay? Uh, if that's not that's not correct, then you can let me know. Okay, so assume that that's what you have to be the uh, the present value of the cash flows. Okay, at say at ten percent. Okay, now you can apply now the two. Now you can go to apply our IRA formula. Okay, just remind you. Okay, the IRA formula. I know you're expert already by now. Okay, is equal to is A plus B. Okay, present value at A present value at A minus present value at B, okay? Where A is the lower discount rate, B is the high discount rate, present value A is the present value at the lower discount rate, and present value B is the present value at the higher discount rate, okay? So simply apply that formula, okay? Which in this case, okay, <clears throat> apply it here. A is our lower discount rate, which in this case is 7%, so 7%, plus the difference between the two of them, the 10% and 10%, 3%. The value at 10%, we got 17.96, we divide by 17.96, minus the value at the higher discount rate, which got 5.89, so minus 5.89, okay? Let's give us, I don't know, maybe 12 point something, and you get 12 point. We have an answer already uh, from asthma. You get 11.5. Confirm 11.5 from asthma. Uh, confirm that answer. We we'll got 11.5. 11.5 more is from Lois. Finally, from Daniel, we get 11.45, 11.5, okay? Uh, and that's how more or less, okay, from Louisa, 11.5, okay? Now, that's how simply we do confirm, uh, we do determine uh, the cost of a convertible bond, okay? So, Stacy, okay, you seem to have a question. Let me unmute you. Stacy? Stacy, is your chance? I thought I did admit you. What happened? I think I admitted you. You know what happened? Stacy, you had your, your hand up, I guess. Is this yes, Stacy? Wait, Stacy, yes. Stacy, you have admitted you. Stacy, I have admitted you. Hey, Stacy, you went quiet. See if someone else in the chat has a question. Uh, from Sharon, why did you use 20 as a conversion ratio? Yeah, uh, Sharon, if just to let me just share back my notes, okay? So, the conversion issue we say that uh, these are the number of shares you get per bond, okay? These are number of shares uh, that you do get per bond, okay? In our question, which is here, the number of bonds you get is 20. Uh, don't forget here, we told that each loan note is converted into 20 equity shares, okay? That's how that's where uh, why we did use uh, 20 shares as a conversion ratio, okay? I hope I have answered your question, Sharon. Stacy, I seem to. There are two Stacy, I'm not sure which is which now. Okay, that's for Stacy Kirui. Oh, so Stacy, okay. Let me check Stacy. 
Ok, Stacy. <coughs> Stacy, I'll unmute you. I'm asking about the rate. Uh, the rate, which rate? Yeah, okay, so I picked 7% and 5%. Oh, you picked, got, what did yeah, you I get? Okay, I got 10.91. Ah, uh, you got 10.91. Yeah, so now uh, how is supposed to like pick the rates because different rates are giving different answers. Um, essentially, okay, I hope you, the answers of your examiner are going to be as robust as possible, okay. Uh, but essentially, okay, uh, since you're using estimation, okay, uh, then the answer, so you're using estimation, uh, if you have done the right way, okay, then essentially you should not be penalized, okay. But because I want to guess that uh, maybe by you using 5% and 10%, okay, you did the right thing altogether, okay. It's only that there's an estimation error, okay, that as we got 11.5%, because you used 7 10%, okay. But you used 5% and 7%, which gave you 11.9%, okay. But essentially, uh, the exam should auto mark the two of them together. Okay, I hope the examiner has as robust as possible. Okay, uh, but essentially, this is how you should be doing it. Okay, it's not that you're, yours is wrong. No, okay, exactly right. Okay, however, uh, ensure that the rates you use are not too far apart. Okay, uh, if for example, in our example here, I, I use 10%, percent. Okay, and I got a positive. Okay, uh, so I may want to move to have a to have a rate. Okay, that's move me closer to a zero, okay? And that's why I did choose a higher discount rate, okay? That's why I chose a 10%, okay? Because you can see this is 17.96. I want to move as close as possible uh, to zero, okay? That's why I did choose a higher discount rate, okay? But it doesn't mean what I've done is wrong. It's okay, don't forget, okay? Okay, yeah, okay. Okay. okay, fair enough. <clears throat> then there seem to some other people who have some question, okay? This is Michelle. Do you have a question? Michelle? I'm, I'm asking about the rates that you've used. Oh, the 7% and 10%. Isn't that uh, a big gap? Or Sorry, is this a big gap? It, it's not a big gap, the 7 and 10. And essentially, it should not be like twice. If, for example, I chose 7%, then I should not go above, for example, 14%, uh, okay? So it's just a, it's just a matter of uh, your own judgment. But essentially, I would propose, okay, uh, that don't go above twice the rate you've chosen, okay? Like, for example, here I chose 7%, then I should not as much as go, go above 14%, okay? If, for example, if my first rate was 10%, okay, then the next rate should not be above, for example, uh, maybe let's say like 20 percent okay so i can use a figure in between those two two rates like 20 between 10 uh, and 20 but not for example above twice the number uh, i have chosen the first time okay that's what i uh, you can choose okay you can choose eight you can choose nine okay you can choose 12 but i would propose you don't choose above for example 14 percent michelle okay. it's clear yeah. okay <clears throat> mm -hmm. Assume if you have the uh, question. Mm. From Janet. Janet asking, I'm not getting 0 0.7 from the, my table. How do you get it? Janet, I, um, I didn't understand your question very well. Let me unmute you, Janet, so that you can clarify uh, on what you were asking. So Janet. Hello. Yes. yes, I've seen I've seen it. Have you seen it? Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Then another question. Um, this is from Lois. When you estimate the power value, must it be estimated upwards? Not necessarily, okay. Uh, but as I say that you want to move as close as possible to zero. Okay, don't forget. Uh, here, our intention is to get an R that give us a zero. That's our intention, that an R that will give us a zero, okay? Uh, so in my first phase, okay, like 10%, I go 17. I want to reduce it, okay? So I have to move upward, more or less, okay? So okay, once you use a high discount rate, you are reducing the present value, okay? But it's not a must, okay? Just uh, like sort of like, okay, a con okay, 
normally what I normally do it, okay, which I prefer it should be, it's much better because you want to get an R, okay, that make, that give you, okay, uh, the sum of present value to be as close as possible to zero. So since I got a, a quite a high value here, okay, that's why I did choose a higher discount rate, okay, that's why I did increase, okay. If for example, just, just for example, here I got negative 20, then the, the best is to reduce now, not to increase now, okay. I, I move from either from 7% to maybe maybe 4%, okay. So now it's going uh, downwards, okay. Because I want now to get a figure close to zero, okay? So I want to now uh, reduce my figures, okay? From negatives to something close to a zero, okay? <clears throat> I hope I've answered your question, Lois. Okay, if not, don't forget to ask. Okay, now which is? Mm -hmm. Janet, okay. Uh, from Charles, I think should be guided by the market value of the bond. If it lies between zero and eight nine, the power value is hundred. Okay, I, hope, I think the uh, yeah, more or less. So just to clarify on that comment from Daniel. Okay, uh, if it lies between zero and eight nine, yeah, more or less going to be hundred. Okay, but not always a guarantee that if, for example, uh, if the market value is one fifty, okay, it does not mean the power value is a thousand. Okay, just to clarify on that comment from Charles. Okay, uh, you generally okay. Uh, market values will not be too far off from the power value of, or from their power values okay so in case that we get a market value of let's say 950 then there's no way the power value can be 100 okay it cannot be a thousand okay uh, so the market values are not going to be too far off, too far off from uh, their power value okay and in some time they may actually be at their power value okay especially for example at the time of issue okay so generally check on the market value okay to give you like a hint okay and as mentioned, there's going to be two of them, either thousand or either hundred. Okay, those are the two power values conventionally for bonds. Okay. Sharon, a question: Did you say the higher the discount rate, the lower the present value? Yes, that's that is it. Okay, so the higher discount rate used, uh, the lower become the present value of cash flows. Okay, the higher the discount rate, uh, the lower the present value. Yes, that is how it is. <clears throat> And that's how we estimate the cost of convertible debt. Okay, that's how we estimate the cost of convertible debt. It's simply just like the uh, redemption value. Okay, the only difference is that in the final year, uh, the holder has an extra option of either converting the bond or redeeming the bond. Okay, and that's on how we get the market, how we get the cost of convertible debt. Okay, I hope everything is clear. Okay, so going back to our notes. Okay. Now here we were estimating. Okay, let me just take you back to uh, one of the mind map that we are discussing. Okay, previously. Yes, here. Okay. So we were discussing the cost of or how we get the cost of debt. Okay, we have bonds. Okay, which I think now we have more or less done with. Okay, we can also estimate how do we get the cost of okay, how do we get the cost of uh, debt now is assuming that it is uh, a bank loan, okay? So this is a bank loan, okay? The cost of debt, but in this case, is the cost of bank loan, okay? Now, in the case of bank, uh, when it comes to estimate the cost of bank loan, you may want to know, what is this bank loan, okay? At what, uh, do you pay a variable interest rate or do you pay a fixed interest rate, okay? How is the interest you pay, okay? Uh, is it paid on maybe the market condition, okay? Uh, is it a fixed rate? Okay, so you may want to get to know uh, what type of loan you're dealing with. Okay, we'll see you can have to. You have a fixed rate loan, and you can have call a floating or a variable interest rate loan. Okay. Okay, so because now we're counting, it may be estimating uh, the cost. It, it might be different. Okay. So it can be the first one, how we get the cost of a uh, bank loan where the interest you do pay is fixed, okay? Where the interest you do pay is fixed, okay? Let's start there, okay? The cost of fixed interest loan, okay? So in case you do have a bank loan, okay? Uh, don't forget, uh, bank loan, they ha don't have market value. So they don't, there's no market value. So there's no peanut sort of, okay? Like we had the case of the bonds, okay? They don't have market value, okay? Uh, so therefore, more or less, what is your cost? Your cost is simply uh, the interest you do pay to the bank. Okay, if it's a ten percent bank loan, okay, the interest you pay to the bank is your cost. Okay, simple as that. That's how you estimate the cost of bank loan. Okay, you don't need to get the market. There's no market value. Okay, but simply this is a bank loan. Okay, 
However, don't forget, you may not check, okay? Uh, is there any interest tax yield, okay? Uh, do you pay tax? Okay, because in case you don't pay tax, then of course your cost is going to be reducing by the interest tax shield. In this case, therefore, the interest tax shield here is 30%. For example, in case uh, you're paying tax on 30% uh, tax bracket, okay? And that's again the cost of bank loan. The interest you pay times, uh, for example, 20%. So that percent is your benefit, okay? That percent is your tax benefit. You only incur a cost of 20% of the interest. And that's again the cost of bank loan, okay? So here we have a simple example, okay, in uh, here. A farm has a fixed uh, rate bank loan of $1 million. It is charged interest of 10% per annum. The tax rate is that percent. You are meant to get the cost of this bank loan, okay? So simply, okay, the cost of this bank loan, okay, uh, you do pay 11%. However, don't forget that percent of it is your benefit, okay? It is your benefit, okay? Therefore, 1 minus 0 0.3, okay, to give us, therefore, the cost of this bank loan to be equal to 7.7%. That's how you estimate the cost of bank loan. Okay. Same as that. Now the next question is that how do we estimate okay, the cost of variable? Okay, and don't forget this is a fixed interest loan. But how do you get the cost? Uh, how do you get the cost of variable interest loan? Okay. If the company has borrowed okay, from a bank or from a financial institution where the interest they're paying is variable, okay, it, is, it moves up and down, okay, depending, for example, on the market condition. Okay? Now, how do we estimate where there is you don't know what's going to be in the next one year, in the next few months? Okay? How are you going to be estimating uh, the cost of that bank loan? Okay? So generally, there are a number of ways of estimating okay, the cost of a variable interest loan. So let me go back to my board okay, just to uh, share with you, okay? <clears throat> so this is where we are now, okay? How we get the cost of floating of valuable interest loan, okay? <clears throat> so cost of valuable interest loan, okay? So here it's valuable interest loan, okay? Valuable interest loan, okay? We want to explain the cost of it. Now, there are a number of ways of trying to estimate the cost of variable interest loan. One of them, okay, is you can use the past. What is the most recent interest you have paid on that bank loan? Okay, so you can use the most recent interest, okay? Use the most recent interest you have paid on it, the most recent uh, interest, okay? But that's what I mean. If, for example, we are in the year 2020, okay, you want to estimate, okay, uh, what uh, uh, interest uh, is a company going to be paying on their variable interest loan this year, okay? You can simply use the data for year 2019. In the year 2019, okay, how much interest did the company pay? They paid 9%. So we can assume that maybe going forward in the year 2020, uh, the same interest shall be applied, okay? Uh, the same interest shall be applied. That's an assumption I'm making, okay? The most recent interest you're paying in the most in the past, okay? That is one of the way. Okay, you can also use, for example, uh, if the company has a similar, okay, if the company has a similar or a proxy, okay, fixed bank loan, okay, if the company has a similar, okay, proxy, proxy in quote, okay, okay, uh, fixed bank loan, okay, okay, that is maybe in terms of the size, the loan, the, the company current, the company has two loans, okay. One is fixed, one is variable, okay. The two loans have, for example, financed the same project, okay, which imply, therefore, uh, the risk to the financial the same, okay. Uh, in terms of the amount, okay, the two loans are in the same amount, cool. one million dollar, one million dollar, okay, both of them, okay. Uh, so the, these loans are more or less similar, okay. The only difference is one is variable, the other one is, for example, is fixed. In that case, therefore, you can estimate the cost of that fixed bank loan, okay? How much is it? 7.7%. Then you can assume, okay, the cost of this variable interest loan, it, is, it will also be 7.7%, okay? It's an assumption you're making, okay? But you're using a proxy, proxy in quote, a bank loan, fixed bank loan, okay? If none of it is available, okay, then what do you do next, okay? Now you can simply uh, be trying to, uh, we can simply, uh, if we don't have, this is a, it's a new loan, okay, you just take it, okay? So the interest is due in six months time, okay? So we don't have history, okay? Neither do you have a fixed bank loan, okay? Now how do you see the cost of this bank loan, okay? You can use any other, okay? You can use any other, okay? Any other debt instrument, any other, uh, cost of similar, maybe 
debt can also any other debt instrument the company has in issue. Okay. The instrument the company has in issue. Okay. So that is how we can estimate the cost of the bank loan. Okay. If the loan is variable. Okay. But essentially, I have not seen an examiner testing that from that angle, but just in case you do know how to estimate the cost of the variable uh, interest loan. Okay. And that's how we do get the cost of bank loans. Going back to our notes. <clears throat> And lastly, but not the least here, uh, how do we get the cost of uh, preference share? So cost of preference share, cost of preference shares. <clears throat> now, preference share, essentially, we do consider them, okay? Well, they sometimes refer to us, they are sometimes uh, referred to as quasi-equity, okay? That is an instrument in between a debt and in between, is in between debt and equity. Okay, it's a debt, it has some element of debt, it has some element of equity. Okay, they're called uh, quasi equity. Okay, they're called uh, quasi equity. Okay, so simply the equity, they are debt, okay, they are in between there. Okay, that's a privilege here is another term that they also called quasi equity. Okay, essentially, therefore, when it comes to estimating, when it comes to estimating uh, the cost of this product share, okay, we are going to make an assumption that these product shares are irredeemable. Okay, that's an assumption. Okay, that these private shares are irredeemable. Okay, just to we can just add it here. Okay, that these private shares are irredeemable. Okay, so the company has no obligation uh, to pay back these bonds. Okay, uh, to pay back the uh, capital. Okay, to the private shareholders. Okay, if they are irredeemable. Okay, therefore, what does it mean? They imply therefore they, there's no end life. There's no end. Okay, there's no end. Okay. Therefore, the market value of those private share, okay, using the fundamental theory of valuation, P naught is equal to the dividend, okay, that the holder get. Don't forget the preferred dividend, they get the, the preference dividend, okay, the preference dividend is a fixed, okay, it's fixed, okay. And since it is fixed to infinity, then the present value of those dividends to infinity is being the dividend, we divide therefore by the cost of those private share, okay. You just simply make the private share, the cost of private share, the subgroup formula, and you add up with this. Okay, this gives therefore the cost of the private share. Okay, RP is dividend, we divide by P naught. Okay, don't get P naught is X dividend uh, share price. And that's what you get the cost of private share. Okay, assuming that they are irredeemable. Okay, assuming that they are irredeemable. Okay. And guys, that's how you get the cost of capital from the different finance sources. Okay, I hope I've been able to touch on all the different finance sources. Okay, all the from equity uh, to preference shares. Okay. Question. Luke, should we take a break? Please, Luke. Yes, Mosoti. Uh, uh, yes, should take a break. Until? Uh, right now, seven, seven? Seven twenty. Seven twenty. Okay, fair enough. Uh, then we take a break. We meet at seven twenty. Okay, see you then. Okay, welcome back for our second session. <clears throat> We are still discussing on how we do estimate the cost of capital from the different finances, uh, from the different finance providers, okay, which I think you discussed all the way from equity, uh, bonds, both redeemable, redeemable, as well as bonds that are convertible, uh, private shares, uh, and um, the bank loans, okay. Now, I want us we discuss on since the company is financed by all these different providers, okay, and since the company is financed by all these different providers, now how would we estimate in totality, okay, once we combine all these provider of capital, debt holders, equity shareholders, uh, preference shareholders, okay, once we combine all of them together, okay, uh, what is the cost, okay, uh, 
to the company, okay? For every dollar the company obtained from each one of, uh, invoice, okay, from each one of these provider of capital, okay? How much cost does the company cut, okay? For the use of those funds, okay? From all those different providers, okay? Okay, the company is one company, okay? Borrowing from each one of these persons, okay? But the company, for every dollar, okay, uh, they obtain from all of them, okay? Generally, okay, how much cost do they incur there for? Okay, how much cost do they incur there for, okay? Therefore, next bit is determined what the fact was the weighted average cost of capital, okay? Weighted average cost of capital, okay? Now, the first step when it comes to estimating, okay, the cost of capital, the cost of capital, okay, for every dollar the company obtained from all these providers of capital, okay, don't get simply weighted average cost of capital, okay, is the amount of return, okay, the amount of return the different providers of capital shall be expecting, okay, from that one dollar they shall be giving to the company, okay. That's referred to as a weighted average cost of capital, okay. That if the company obtain money from debt holders, obtain money from plan shareholder, obtain money from equity shareholder, okay, the company obtain a dollar, okay, from all of them. So this one dollar came from three, from these three people, okay, equity shareholder, debt holder, private shareholder. Once we combine them, okay, how much return do the company shall be? Give? The company must give, okay, for that one dollar they do they have used for the providers of capital. That's referred to as the weighted average cost of capital. Okay, that's referred to as weighted average cost of capital. Okay, the company has obtained money from the different providers of capital. Okay, shareholders, debt holders, equity shareholders, uh, all of them combined. How much return do they want? Okay, generally, when it comes to estimating the weighted average cost of capital, okay, the first step is to get the cost of capital which I think I've mentioned, uh, from all the individual providers of capital, okay? If the company obtain money from equity shareholders, okay, then first thing, get the cost of capital from the cost of the, from the uh, equity shareholder, the cost of equity. If the company obtain money from debt holders, then get the cost of debt from that debt holder. If the company has obtained um, capital, okay, from private shareholder, then get the cost of uh, capital from the private shareholders. So the first step determining or estimating uh, the cost of capital from the individual providers of capital. Next step is to get the weights, okay? So the next step is to determine. Uh, if you are to estimate as per today's term, okay? If you are to estimate as per today's term, okay? How much of capital did the, has the company obtained from equity shareholder? How much of capital has the company obtained from debt holders? How much of capital has the company obtained from private shareholder, okay? So get the, the weights, okay? And generally, we do use, of course, the market values. When it comes to getting the weights, we use the market values, not the book values, okay? Essentially, okay? Why do you use the market value, okay? The, the, in essence, we prefer to use the market value because the market value will be reflecting today's condition, market, okay? You simply go to the market. If the company has equity share, go to the market. Currently, one share of this company, how much was it, was it trading at, okay? So you use the market weights, we use the market values. Okay. Essentially, we try to avoid the book values. Okay, why? Because the book value shall be reflecting what happened when that particular instrument was being issued. Okay, if, for example, the company issued their shares in 2010, if you use the book values, it means therefore you gain be using the values, you gain be using the status as at 2010. However, we, however, we are in the year 2020 now. 10 years later, okay? So there's no you can use the market, you can use the book values, okay? Otherwise, you're going to have distorted figures, okay? The cost of capital you're getting is going to be distorted. In most cases, okay, the market value of equity shares go way above their book values, okay? The market values of equity shares goes way above the book values. Would imply, therefore, if you are to uh, use the book values, and the market values of the equity shares is way apart, is way different from their book values, then you're going to have very distorted figures, okay? You're going to be having very distorted figures, okay? That's what I mean by that particular point, okay? You're going to have to, to be underestimating, okay, the contribution of the equity towards the entire company cost of capital. Since you're going to be using low figures for book values, okay, it means you're going to be underestimating the cost of capital for the entire company, the contribution of cost equity to the entire company cost of capital, okay? 
if for example the company okay just to, to, to illustrate that point okay let me go back to my board okay i'm trying to say that when it comes to estimating the cost of capital okay for the fact was the weighted average cost of capital what do we do okay, it, it is given us assuming that this company okay this is an assumption of just make uh, trying to make uh, the company is financed. <coughs> the company is financed by uh, two provider of capital. Okay, first is provided. It's, it is financed by debt, and the company is also financed by equity. So there are only two of them. Okay, uh, debt and equity. We are seeing the first step. Okay, actually, yes, let me just uh, do it in a better way. <coughs> so the company is financed. Okay, so here the company. Let me say source of capital source of capital is two we have debt and we have equity so the first step determine where the money came from the money came from two finances from debt and from equity next step of course is okay you can say more is like step one then step two get the cost of capital cost of capital from the individual capital sources cost of capital okay uh from the individual from the individual sources okay so for this case therefore since the company is financed by two sources okay uh, get therefore so a get the cost of debt okay b get the cost of equity okay so get the cost of equity then the last step okay we need to is to get the weights okay we need to get the weights okay so get the market weights market weights okay of course from each of the financials each of the capital source okay get the market weight for each of the capital source okay how do you get the market weights i'll say that essentially market weight is simply okay the market weights just to make a mention okay if for example we are dealing with a case of equity share okay in case you want to estimate the uh, market weight of equity okay what do we do it seems we're going to determine what we call the market capitalization, determine what we call the total market value of all the company issued shares. Okay, so get the market capitalization, okay, market value of all those shares. Okay, uh, so maybe you can say here it will be equal to, okay, the number of shares issued, okay, number of equity shares issued, okay, we multiply by the market value per share, okay, uh, simply is going to get the market value or simply the market capitalization of equity shares. If the company is, uh, uh, has bonds, okay, or this debt you have here, okay, is bond, uh, okay, it is a debt, is a bond, is a debt financing, okay, through the issue of bond, okay, then the market value of those bonds, okay, will be equal to, of course, the number of bonds issued, okay, number of bonds issued, number of bonds issued, we multiply therefore by the market value per bond, okay, by the market value per bond, okay. Let's simply get the market values or they get the market weights okay once you done that okay you get the market you, you've obtained the market values now you can weigh them okay you determine okay the company obtained money from debt okay true what was the cost of debt okay for every dollar the company obtained from debt they are getting a cost or they are being charged a cost of example an example uh rd okay how much has the company obtained from them okay there was the entire cost okay so if you get charged 10 percent okay and this person gave you uh 10 million there was a cost is 10 percent of 10 million okay however however we're using the market values okay therefore is the cost of debt we multiply by the market value of debt okay we multiply by the market value of debt now the company is not just financed by debt okay the company is financed by equity for example okay it has equity it has debt also okay now the other cost the company is incurring there with a plus okay is the company is not financed by equity the equity shareholder also want a return how much they want how much time they want they want uh 18 percent how much money have they given the company 10 million they have, how much return do they want 18 percent of 10 million okay they have 18 percent the cost of equity we multiply by the market value of equity okay now here i'm not using book values okay i'm using market values so that's because therefore the cost the company will be paying okay more or less like at, at the end of the year okay this is the amount the company okay, is meant to be paying uh, at the end of the year therefore the next thing is what okay 
what is the total amount of money the company obtained from these two providers of capital okay the total amount they are obtained from them okay from from debt they obtain okay the market value of debt from equity they obtain the market value of equity and that's again the cost of capital for the entire company okay and this would refer to as the weighted average cost of capital okay that's what was the weighted average cost of capital okay where okay here where rd as i can mention there's a cost of debt okay don't forget here i would just assume the company is financed by two capital sources okay uh, we have equity and we have debt so cost of equity okay and this company also is financed so mvd is market value of debt market value uh, of debt <clears throat> and mve of course market value of equity okay it's market value of equity okay and that's how you estimate therefore the weighted average cost of capital okay so first thing determine where the money came from where is the capital who are the capital providers okay next thing we turn the cost of capital from each one of them next thing get the market values and lastly we determine what we call the weighted average cost of capital okay if the company has private share, you just add, okay? You just add here, for example, market value private share, cost of private share, market value private share, okay? Plus here, private share, for example, okay? So simply going to be adding, okay, to our equation there, okay? And that's how you get the cost of capital for the entire company, okay? Great. Now, having learned that, then now it's to determine, okay, or simply uh, we estimate, okay, uh, we have a, a, a case or well, a, a question, okay, uh, where we are meant to determine not not the cost of capital for the individual capital source, okay, but for the entire company. In, in simple terms, we determine or refer to as the weighted average cost of capital, okay. So let's do a question. I hope it's all clear, okay? If not, um, don't forget to ask. Okay, <clears throat> I want to go to my notes. Okay, so we do a question. So go through this question, uh, we attempt together. Okay, so take one minute to go through the question. Okay, I presuppose that you have gone through the question, okay? And more or less, I've had a mind map, okay, of how you should start off the question. Okay, as I just mentioned, okay. Uh, don't forget what I meant first do is you determine where the company uh, finances came from, okay, where the company capital came from, okay, and in this example, the company capital uh, came from ordinary share capital, okay, you can see we have ordinary uh, shares, okay, the company capital also came from preference share capital, okay, the company shares also came from bonds, or the so-called the notes, okay, so those are three capital sources okay that's normally again the first step okay let me go back to my board okay to note of those capital sources okay so first capital source okay so capital okay, it came from <coughs> equity okay it came from preference shares came from bonds or then the so-called the notes the first step recognizing where the money uh, where the company capital sources came from next is to get the cost from each of those individual sources okay so you get the cost of capital okay from each of uh, those individual sources okay so let me just draw us a simple table okay Okay, so next is to get the cost, okay, from each one of them. 
And then the cost, if I go back to my notes, okay, and the cost uh, from equity, the cost from equity, the cost of capital for these securities, uh, for equity being the last one, uh, note for bonds is 9%, private shares 12%, and for equity 18%. Okay, so, so 9, 12, and 18. So it is 18%, uh, 12%, and 9%. Okay. Now again, essentially, in conversion cases, you will be the one who's going to be doing this. Okay, you're the one to estimate the cost of equity. You're the one, of course, using all those models of discuss. You get the cost of private shares, and you get the cost of bonds. But in this example, already given. So you don't need to do the, the, this set in this example. Okay, but essentially, you're the one who's meant to do this. Okay. Once you get the cost of capital from each of those capital sources, okay, is to get the, to get the weights now, okay, to get the market values, okay, or the, so, and simply the weights. Okay, so the market weights. For equity, these are equity shares, therefore you're going to be the number of equity shares issued we multiply by the market value per equity share. Okay, so let me go back to my notes to determine the number of equity shares issued. This company has issued 5 million on the shares. Okay, so there are 5 million of them. Okay, so there are 5 million. We multiply by the market value per equity share. The market value per equity share is 25 cents. Okay, you can see here it is 25 cents. We divide therefore the total market value of those shares is 5 million. Okay, the number of shares times the market value per share. Okay, so let me go back to my board. The market value is 5 million shares. Okay, we multiply by the market value per share, which is equal to uh, 0 0.25. Okay, to give us therefore uh, 1 million, okay, 250,000 to be the market value of the company equity shares. Okay, get the market values. Next is to get the market value of the company present shares. Okay, the market value of the company present share. Okay. So here, going back to my notes, I need to get the number of private share issued. And this company has um, the book value of the company present share. Okay, you can see the book value of the company present share. Okay. Okay, the book value company present share is six twenty five thousand, and one share is one dollar has a book value of one dollar. We well, simply that mean that for this company has six twenty five thousand issued preference shares. One share is quoted or is trading at forty cents. Okay, it is trading at forty uh, cents. Okay, having done that, then now you can go simply use it. Okay, <clears throat> therefore we go back to our board. Okay. The number of issued per share is six twenty-five thousand. Okay, we multiply by the market value per private share, which is equal to zero point four, and that gives therefore the market value of the company per share, which is how much? Good answer, lady. Um, from noise, we get. To fifty thousand. Okay, confirm. Okay, from Stacy, we get to fifty thousand. Okay, so you get the market value of the company present shares to be equal to fifty thousand. Okay, and lastly, we get the market value of the company bonds. Okay, so we go back to the notes to determine how many bonds has this company issued. What's the market value per bond? The what is the total market value of the company? Issued bonds. Okay. Here, this company has bonds with a market value, okay, of fifty dollars quoted. Don't forget the quotation. Uh, simply means the market value, okay. That's called the quotation, okay, which is equal to fifty. They have how many notes have been issued? Don't forget one note here, okay, has a par value of a hundred. What's the book value of those notes issued? It is one million dollar. Okay. They have simply. There was a market value of company bonds. Okay, the total market value of the company bonds. Okay, go back to my notes. Is equal to one million. Okay, we multiply the market value is fifty. Okay, however the power value is hundred. So we divide by hundred, which you get therefore to be half a million. Okay, the market value of the company issued bonds is half a million. Okay, it is half a million. Therefore, we get what should therefore be the total market value, okay, of the company shares, okay, 
the total market value company share therefore okay should be equal to we get a total value here okay so here we get the total market values to get how much <clears throat> so 1.25 plus 50 plus 500,000 i guess we get 2 million yes okay i think we get 2 million yes from noise she has confirmed so you get 2 million therefore to be the total market value from all those three capital sources now the next bit is jamming okay what is now the cost to the entire company. Don't forget, from equity shareholder, 18%. Private capital, 12%. From bonds, 9%. But the three combined ways, okay? If you have to combine the three of them, how much do they charge the company, okay? They will get what we call with an average cost of capital. The return the company is paying to the equity shareholder, the return the company is meant to be the equity shareholder, okay, is 18% of how much? Of 1.25 million, okay? The return of the company, okay, is meant to pay to uh, the present shareholder, okay, is 12% times the capital, which in this case is to 50,000. The return of the company is meant to pay to the bondholders, okay, is 9%, we multiply by half a million. The three combined, okay, the three provider capital combined, okay, how much, did, how much did, have they financed the company? They have financed the company, two million dollars a year okay we divide therefore by two million dollar okay and that gives therefore the weighted average cost of capital okay hope it's clear okay so this is the return okay let me just use a good pen so this is the return the company is paying to the equity shareholder this is the return the company is paying to the private share this is the return the company is paying to the board holder or the company is meant for every dollar they're going to be accessing from the market okay so all those give us cost but per dollar how much do we incur that's when we divide by two million dollar and you get how much okay and we get some answers okay we got some answers from some of you and we get from extra abdi all the details we get 15 percent to be the cost of capital so simply don't get the three combined we're trying to say okay the, th the three capital providers okay as well as Naomi, uh how much in return for every dollar okay the three of them are going to give to the company how much return do they want they want a return of 15 percent and that's how you get the cost of capital for a company. The cost of capital for a company. I hope it's very clear. Okay. And if there's someone whose heads was up, let me check. Yes, that was that is Stacy. Stacy, I want to unmute you. Yes, Stacy. I had, I had a question for the bonds. Yes, the bonds, yes. Why are we doing one million times fifty over one hundred? instead of just 1 million times 50. Oh, okay. Thank you, thank you, Stacey. Okay, let me refer you back to our notes here. <clears throat> now, Stacey is asking, why are you just not multiplying 1 million times 50? Don't forget, the 1 million half have here, these are not the number of bonds. The 1 million half have is not the number of bonds. However, the 1 million, okay, let me just restate here, okay, uh, this 1 million dollar is the total book value of the all the company issued bonds, the book value, the total book values. The book value per bond, okay, so the book value, okay, per bond is equal to 100. We have it here, okay, is equal to 100 dollars. What you mean, therefore, how many bonds has a company issued, okay? The number of bonds company has issued is the one million dollar, the total book value divided by the book value per bond. We divide by 100. To give us 10,000. So the number of bonds issued by this company is 10,000 bonds. What's the market value per bond? It's 50. If we multiply, therefore, by 50 to give us half a million dollars to be the market value of those bonds, which is simply 1 million times 50 divided by 100. Okay. Okay, but from the way I'm reading the question, yes. like it says the company has 1 million loan notes. It's like one million bonds in issue. 
it's no, there's a sign there. Okay, one million dollar. I don't I don't know where they can. Oh, is it? Can you see it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's one million dollar. It's not one million loan notes. It's one million dollar. Okay, it's the value of those notes. I, I hope this is clear. Okay, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It is not the numbers of bonds, but the value of those bonds. Okay. So you yeah, know yeah. yeah, okay, okay, that's good. <clears throat> okay, and that's how we do get the weighted average cost of capital uh, for finance for uh, cost for capital from the different providers of capital. Now I would want us we do this question. Yes, that is a very easy one. Okay, yes. Take two minutes to go through the question, then I think we can attempt it together. Okay, I presuppose that you have gone through the question and you have been able to pinpoint some of the things that you ought to get uh, before you get the completed average cost capital. Okay, as I mentioned, the first step is always going to determine where the company obtains its money from. Okay, and from the structure, Okay, from the company capital structure, okay, uh, if you can see that the company has uh, obtained money from okay, share capital and also from bonds. Okay, those are the two finance sources. Okay, from the equity and from debt. Okay, next step is to get therefore the cost from each one of them. Okay, so let me just go to my board here. Okay, so capital came from two sources, it came from debt. That is the bonds and also came from equity. Okay, next is to get their cost. Okay, next to get their cost. Okay, uh, so let me have my first work in here to get the cost of equity, which I think is a bit easier to get the cost of equity. As for the information given, okay, let me just go back to my to our notes. You can see that the, they have been given. Okay, so here we have debt, the history about the debt. A simple imply that for what we do, we are going to be using the dividend valuation model. Okay, and as for the dividend valuation model, we did say that the market value or the cost of equity, okay, is equal to d not one plus g, uh, p not plus g. Okay, so you normally go into which model should I be using? Okay, you may want to ask yourself, but don't forget to ask for the information given to you. In this context, uh, you'll be told the history of the dividend of the company. So simply, it implies therefore you will be using the dividend valuation model. Okay. Now we get the variables. We get the D note, the most recently paid dividend. Okay. Let me go back to our notes. In this case, I can see we do have year 2014 to be our recent dividend. Okay. In this case, therefore, it is one of five dollar, one of five cents of a dollar. Okay. The simple, therefore, uh, give me, therefore, uh, that's kind of therefore the most recent dividend. Okay, the company, okay, uh, we do the share, the shares of the company current trading at 7.2 come dividend, okay, for the year 2014. They come dividend, okay, so you need to remove the, the P. Don't forget, the P is also on X basis, okay, it is always on X basis, okay, so we need to estimate, well, therefore, what should be uh, the uh, the X dividend share price, okay? So D not, okay? The most recent dividend, okay? Okay, uh, you'll be told. However, you have, you have to be quite careful, okay? Because if the share is trading come dividend, what does it mean? In the mean, therefore, the shares are trading with the anticipation of receiving the dividend, okay? There's that anticipation, okay? Because for the share to become dividend, in the mean, therefore, there is an anticipation, okay, that you're going to be receiving the dividend, okay. So essentially, okay, now this 105, okay, this dividend, okay, let me just erase here, this dividend, okay, the 105 cents we have here, okay, is actually not D naught, is actually not D naught, okay. Why? Because the shares are trading calm dividend. They are trading calm dividend, okay. Don't forget what we said that if you're going to be uh, having D not essentially is the most recently paid, okay? That's past tense, okay? The most recently uh, paid dividend, okay? Now, if the company shall be paying the dividend, 
okay if the company shall be paying the dividend okay uh within a period okay where the share price has already done the incorporation of those dividends okay then we can deem those dividends okay uh to be d not okay take note of that okay if the company okay if the shares of the company are trading come dividend okay that is there is anticipation okay that i as shareholder of this company i shall be receiving the dividend in the next three months in the next not three months in the next three weeks for example okay then essentially we can consider those dividends okay even if they have not been paid even if they have not been paid okay to be our d notes if the shares if the shares of the company or if the company uh won't pay the dividend okay let's say in two months time okay in two months time okay however the shares of the company are here to okay the shares of the company are here to incorporate that news of uh dividend paid in two months time then that dividend we paid in two months time becomes therefore our d1 okay so get to get all that clear okay d not and d1 d not and d1 because uh once you get that clear it becomes easy to apply the model once you confuse then of course you're going to get the wrong uh, cost of equity let me repeat okay in this example okay let me just go back to this example when you're doing just doing it now okay the shares are trading come dividend the share are trading come dividend okay and in the form the 105 has already been incorporated in the share price okay it has already been incorporated into the share price now what that is what does that there for me okay and me therefore the p the 105 we have here okay is d not is d not even if it maybe have not been paid even if it has not it is yet to be paid okay and therefore our d not okay if for example the 105 cents okay was repaid okay let's say two months from uh maybe the end of your 204 okay and it is yet to be incorporated in the share price the 7.2 was x dividend okay then that would be d1 not d naught okay if the share price was x dividend okay however we are anticipating to receive the dividend okay in two months in three months in four months okay and then that's become for our d1 but if the share price has already done the incorporation of the news of the dividend okay like in our context here okay 7.2 then that will for our d naught Okay, therefore, do not we have it here. Okay, so do you have it here? Therefore, the one five comes for our D not the P not. Okay, the X dividend. Okay, is the come dividend, which is 7.2 minus the dividend, which is in this case is 1.05. Okay, to give us 6.15. I want to guess. Okay, to give us therefore our X dividend to be 6.15 to be the uh, P not. Okay. Next thing is you can get a G, okay, the growth in the dividend, okay. We are there for G, would be equal to. If you go back to our history of the dividend, okay, we have all the way from two o one to two o four, okay. So you can get the growth, okay, between two one and two o four. Uh, what has been the annual growth in the dividend, okay? Therefore, with the year of growth is equal to we have one year, we have two years, and you have three years. So the three years of growth, not four, but three years of growth, okay. To one, two, two, one, two, 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 three, two, and two, three, two, four, to give us three years of growth. All the way from 88 to 105, okay, from 88.2 uh, to 105, okay. Let's go back to our board, okay. It is all the way from 88.2 uh, to 105, but this growth has been experienced over three years. Therefore, part of three minus one, that gives, therefore, it is going to be the annual growth in the dividend. Is that much? Okay, we have answers here and we get 5.98. So 5.98 percent account for the annual growth in the dividend. And we have all the variables. We have P naught, we have D naught, and we have the G. Therefore, the cost of equity for this model, for this example, therefore, D naught is 1.05. The growth is 5.98. P naught is 6.15 plus the growth, which is 0.0598. We give us how much to be the cost of equity. Okay, we seem to have answers and we do get uh 24%, okay, from most of you, okay, 24%, okay, fair enough. Then we get the cost of equity to be 24%, okay.
Now you've done that for cost equity. Now here we have the cost being 24% from our calculation. Okay. Now we need to get the cost of debt. Okay. So next is to get the cost of debt. Cost of debt. Okay. For the cost of debt, so this is a bond. Okay. So you have to know what type of bond are we dealing with. Okay. You may have to get note of that. Okay. What type of bond are we dealing with? Okay. For example, in this question, okay, the bonds are currently in at one or two, and they have maturity. A period of 10 years, okay. So, from here, okay, they mature in 10 years' time. What do you mean, therefore, these bonds, okay, are more or less or called bonds that are redeemable because they're going to be redeemed at the end of year 10, okay. They're going to be redeemed at the end of year 10. And we want to estimate, therefore, uh, what should be uh, their current, what should be, therefore, their, their current uh, cost. If you go back to the capital structure, you'll be told that these bonds, okay, they do pay interest at 12%. Okay. So 12%, I think of variables, the market value is 92, and the tax here you can see is 30. Okay, so therefore we need to use the net interest, not the gross interest, but net interest. Okay. So let me go back to our board here. So we can get the interest. So the interest in uh, receipt uh, will be equal to 12% times the power value of 100. However, the for that percent is taxed, 0 0.3, okay? Uh, to give us, therefore, I want to guess 8.4, okay? Therefore, for the next 10 years, every year, this holder, for every bond they own in the company, the net interest income is equal to 8.4, okay? Is equal to 8.4, okay? In the final year, okay, that is year 10, okay? The redemption occurs in year 10. The redemption value, okay, the question is silent. So as always we say, we always assume uh, the redemption occurs at the power value of 100. The current market value will be told of this bond is equal to, let me check the notes again, okay, to confirm uh, on the market value, the market value will be told is equal to 92. Okay, P naught therefore is equal to 92. P naught is equal to 92 dollars. We have all the variables we need now, okay. Therefore simply, we can estimate what therefore should be the cost of the bond. Don't forget, since this bond is redeemable, if the bond was to be irredeemable, okay, let me just go to the next uh, uh, part of the board. <clears throat> okay, you don't need to do this, uh, as I'm always saying, okay, but just for your calculation. What would be the cost of the same bond if it was to be irredeemable, okay? It would be equal to, okay, let me go to previous board, it would be equal to the interest, 8.4, we divide by the market value, which is 92, okay? If this bond was to be irredeemable, 8.4 divided by 92, Okay, that would be equal, give us therefore the cost of the bond if it was to be redeemable. Okay, so get the interest, we divide the peanut, we express as a percent. Okay, therefore this will be put 8.4 divided by 92 uh, as a percent. What do you get? Okay, so some example for us <clears throat> get 9.13, 9.13 percent. Okay. Don't forget, you don't need to do this, okay? 9.1, thank you. Okay, don't forget, you don't need to do this actually, okay? You don't need to do this. You don't need to do this. But this is just to help you out, okay? You don't need to do this in the exam, okay? But this is just to help you to know where your cost of debt would be, okay? So like, for example, here you know it should be a roughly nine, okay? This is just like part of uh, our, our working working out of, outside of your, of your normal working, okay? Then we can therefore have our first discount rate to be at nine, okay? We can have therefore our first discount rate to be at 9%, okay? Therefore, 92, okay, the market value of this bond, okay, should be equal to the interest you get, 8.4 times present value added factor, okay? Uh, 10 years R percent per cost of debt, okay? Uh, plus, okay, uh, redemption value 100, present value interest factor, 10 years, 100%, okay? Now, what if we discount this cash flows at 9% of as per what you just calculated above there, okay? Therefore, zero should be equal to negative 92, okay? Plus uh, 8.4 times present value and factor, 10 years, okay? Uh, okay, I want us to use 9%, okay? So here, our rate here, we want to discount at 9%. Our first discount rate is at 9%, okay? Uh, 9% plus 100 times present value interest factor, uh, 10, 9%. Uh, what the sum, by the way? 
if we discount this cash flows, okay, at 9%, what do we get? In case he has positive 4.11, sorry, 4.11. Someone confirm? Yes, Lois also confirms uh, that you get a positive one, 4.11, okay? That is if we discount those cash flows at 9%, okay? 4.11, okay? I suppose that all of you have that, okay? Now, what if we use the same of cash flows, okay? No, a second discount rate, okay? And we discount them at, for example, at let's say 10% or 11%, what I prefer, okay? Let me just choose 10%, okay? Same cash flows, but now at 10%, okay? At 10%. Therefore, it will be equal to, so this is at 10%, okay? At 10%. To be equal to negative 92, okay, plus 8.4 times present value and factor 10 years 10 percent plus 100 present value interest factor 10 years 10 percent. What do you get? Okay, we get uh, we get uh, negative eight point four, negative one point eight four. Okay, that is as far as from Daniel uh, as well as from about eight point negative eight one point eight four. Okay, now therefore we can now be able to estimate therefore what should be uh, the cost of the debt. Okay, we know it is between nine and ten. Okay, therefore you can use IRR formula. Okay, the cost of this debt. Okay, will be called A being nine percent plus the difference, 10 minus 1, 1%. The value at 9%, don't forget 9% is our lower discount rate. Okay, we got uh, 4.11 divided by 4.11 minus minus 1.84. Don't forget this is minus minus, to give us a plus. Okay, so you can simply use a plus, so by minus minus, okay. And you get 9 point. Nine point eight. Okay, and you get 9.69 Lois. Someone to confirm 9.69 from Lois. Yeah, now we also got 9.69 uh, percent. Okay, and that's what you get for the cost of this, uh, the cost of this uh, uh, bond. Okay. Now going back, okay, so to our more stable, okay, we got 9.69 percent, therefore to be the cost. Okay, what well, the next thing we do, we get the market values. Okay, the next step is to get the market values. Okay, so the next thing is to get the market value of these notes. Okay, so next, we get the market values. So, market values. We begin. Okay, so, so, we get the market values. Okay, so we get the market value of debt. Okay, all these bonds. Okay, and the market value of equity. Okay, the market value of this bond. I'll go back to my notes. The market value of this note, uh, as per the extract we have here, the total, okay, the total nominal value, the total nominal value, okay, of the company uh, bonds is half a million. You can see it here, okay, half a million. And one bond, okay, of course, has a power value of 100, okay, has a power value of 100. And it's going for 92. Therefore, the market value of those notes is simply 500 okay, times 92 divided by 100. Okay, so 500 will be 500,000. Okay, times 92, we divide by 100, the power value for one bond. Okay, to give us how much? Four. Okay, we have an answer here from to get for sixty thousand. Thank you. To get for sixty thousand. Okay, we get for sixty thousand to the market value of those notes. The next we get the market value of equity. Okay, 
So you want to finish, okay, make a market value of equity. So going back to our notes, the market value of equity, we need to determine how many shares this company has. As per, the, as per the company balance sheet, we can see the total market value, book value of the company share is 150,000. And the power value per, per bond, power value, of, power value of one of the share, we can see it here, is $1. They simply mean, it simply mean therefore, the number of bonds issued for this company is 150,000. Okay, because one bond is one share. Okay. Then we multiply by that by the market value of one share, okay? The P note, which we got it somewhere. So let me let's go back to our board. Okay. Therefore, the number of bonds issued is 150,000 divided by one. So we don't need to divide, but just to show you. We multiply therefore by the P note, the X interest, the X dividend share price, which you got in one of our board here, which I think we have already done. Where is it? Yeah, here it is. Okay, we multiply by the P note or the X interest and the X dividend uh, market value of one share six point one five. Don't multiply by seven point two. Don't multiply by P note the X interest the X dividend the six point one five. Okay, so here we multiply by six point one five. Okay, to give us how much? Okay, you have an answer already. Uh, we have to be in nine, 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 twenty two thousand five hundred. Okay, nine, two thousand five hundred. You can therefore uh, the market value uh, of each of those financials. The two combined, therefore, have a market capital, uh, a market value of how much? The two combined, so the uh, debt and equity, one million. Thank you, Daniel. Nine twenty thousand five hundred. True. Total market value of the two, of the two finance sources. <clears throat> We've got one million three eight two thousand five hundred. Okay, one million three two thousand five hundred from Naomi. There's some two people here who have a question. Uh, thank you, Evelyn. Let me check them out first. Is it Louisa? Louisa. Louisa, you have your you you, you hand up. Yes, uh, I was wondering, yes. and the, the shares in millions, it's 150 million. I see, they're in million? Oh, yes. Okay, okay I, let me check it again. Oh, they're in million, even, Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ten million. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ten million. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So they're in million. So therefore, in this case, these are in thousands. Okay. Then these are in thousands. Okay. Uh, because I assume that they are in thousands. Okay. So simply, therefore, uh, the thousand or simply uh, nine nine ninety two point five million. Okay. And the same applies for the debt. Okay. Uh, it will be equal to uh, four sixty million. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, fair enough. That's how we get the market value. Then simply now, I think now we can determine the company with an average cost of capital. So the debt has a market value, okay, of 460 of million. So 460 million, okay. We multiply by the cost of debt, which I think you've already done it here. The cost of debt, we have it here, okay. You have it here, 9.69, okay, so 9.69. So 9.69% plus the market value of equity, which you got 9.22.5 million times the cost of equity, which we have already done. Okay, cost of equity, we have it here, 24%. 24%. We divide by the market value for the two sources, okay, 1, mi 1 billion, okay, uh, 382.5 million. And you get how much? You have an answer already <clears throat> uh, from Lois nineteen point two three percent. Confirm.
Okay, from Stacy, 19.28, not too way off. 19.24 from uh, Stacy also, okay. Uh, I suppose that's how it is, okay. When again, 19.23%, therefore, uh, to be the cost of uh, the cost of capital for the entire company, okay. It's for the entire company, okay. That for every dollar the company obtained from this debt holder and this debt equity shareholder, the two combined, okay. They're going, the two of them are going to give one dollar to the company, but they'll be requiring a ton of 19.23 cents every year. That's what that 19.23% means. And that's how you get the company cost of capital. I hope it's very clear because most likely it will be the exam. Okay. It will be the exam. I hope it's very clear. Okay. Okay. I would want to add the class there. I think the class has taken more than normally take. But I think it was for a worth cost. Okay.